Okay, so today I'm going to talk about limits. Now, limits are really important in category theory. I mean, one of the main things that you do in category theory is you identify these sort of structures in categories which represent particular things which are important in mathematics. So we've seen examples already like terminal objects and the categorical product of a pair of objects. These are both examples of limits, but there are many more, okay? So for example, remember the categorical products basically gave us a notion of what it meant to multiply two objects together. But this was a notion which didn't just apply when we were dealing with sets and we we're thinking of, you know, how can we find the product of two sets? It's a notion which can be imported into lots of other contexts. We can find the product of two monoids, the product of two graphs, the product of two categories. So once we have that basic kind of categorical notion of a product, um, you know, we could just apply it all over the place. Now, what we basically do with limits is to take that kind of idea, but once we define what a limit is, we'll see that we don't just have the categorical product, we have a innumerable collection of other types of mathematical gizmos, many of which also correspond to sort of meaningful things. So for example, there's one kind of limit which is called an equalizer. When we're dealing in the category of sets, the equalizer corresponds to finding the solution to equations. I mean, solving equations is obviously really important in mathematics. However, with this notion of an equalizer, we can basically, in a general kind of setting, we can say, well, we have two functions from one set to another, and the equalizer kind of naturally defines the solution set, the set of elements in the first set, which get mapped in the same way by both of the functions. But we define this notion categorically. So we then know basically what solving equations means in all these other contexts as well. And, you know, the categorical product and the equalizer are just two examples of limits. There are so many more. And we're going to give a general definition of what limits are. We're going to look at some examples and we're going to sort of delve into the kind of structure of limits, which is really a very interesting mathematical structure. It involves things like the, it's um, involving sort of natural transformations. And when we look at the mathematics of limits, we sort of are able to see things on many different levels. So we can look at what limits are, what limits look like when we sort of zoom right out and look at this picture of the category of categories, where we see the objects are categories and we have these arrows between them, functors, and these natural transformations between functors. So we can sort of see what's going on with limits at that level. We can zoom in a little bit and think about all of the functors between a pair of categories and, and the natural transformations between those and see how a limit is considered in that kind of context. And limits also, of course, have an interpretation on the actual level of the categories where we can see these interesting diagrams that look kind of like, um, they look kind of like three-dimensional images of pyramids or cones. Well, we'll see some very interesting kinds of pictures coming about today. So we're gonna have a look at the mathematics of this. We're also going to make a connection with universal properties. And that's going to allow us to show that any two similarly defined limits are going to be isomorphic to each other. And that's gonna be very useful. That's like a, a kind of generalization of what we proved to hold for a categorical product. Okay, so now it's time to understand the definition of a limit. So what we're going to start with is the idea of a categorical product. I'm going to go through the definition of a categorical product, and then we're going to step back a little bit and 
think about how that works and how we might want to say what's going on using a bit more of the kind of language of category theory, the language of categories, functors and natural transformations. And then we're just going to get the definition of a limits kind of just coming out. So how's, how are we going to start? Let's just start by going through the definition of a categorical product again quickly. So we choose a couple of objects, A and B, that we want to find the categorical product of. That's the first step. We have to choose the objects. And then we want to find a object which we can call A times B. That's our actual categorical product. I may also call it R today. And um, we want there to be an arrow from this categorical product into A and an arrow into B. And it has to be such that for any other thing, any other candidate, X, which has an arrow into A and into B, there ought to be a unique intermediary arrow, H, which makes this diagram commute, okay, in the sense that we have f is equal to pi 1 after h and g is equal to pi 2 after h. Okay, so that's the definition of a categorical product. Now let's go through that again, but this time we're going to be a bit more, a bit more pondering, okay? Okay, so we have this category C. And we want to find the categorical product of some things. So the first thing we need to do is to choose two objects. And how do we do that? Well, that's a little bit of a funny question, isn't it? I mean, um, we've been choosing things ever since we were babies. We, we know what choosing things means, but do we know how to say it in terms of category theory? Well, it's very profitable to ask, even with very basic things, you know, how can we describe this in category theory? And what about choosing two objects? Well, can we do it with categories and functors? Well, how about this? What about if we have another category here? We'll call it I. And this is just a category which has two objects. Let's call them little i and little j. And the only arrows in this category are the identity arrows. So as a way of choosing two objects in this category C, how about we just think about a functor from i to c? So say we have a functor, let's call it D. And so here's going to be D of I. This is where object I gets sent to under this functor. And here's going to be D of J. So that does the job, right? That, that chooses these two objects. Um, we're going to have identity arrow, these identity arrows over here are going to get sent to the identity arrows of these objects in this category C. I won't bother drawing those identity arrows. Um, so that's good. Now we know what choosing things means. It means that we have a category which, um, you know, if we're just choosing objects and we have this category which doesn't have any non-trivial arrows and choosing just means doing a functor um, from that kind of category representing this, this pattern of two objects 
uh, inside our category C. And this really gives us what we want to start with the definition of a categorical product, right? Because we just want two objects and they could even be the same, okay? We're allowed to do the categorical product of an object of itself. So it could be that this D sends both of these objects to the same object over here. Okay, so now we know what choosing things means. We know what it means to choose these two objects over here in this category C. And this is good for various reasons. Um, one reason is that we can generalize this, okay? So what about if we had some more elaborate category I? Maybe it has more objects. Maybe it has arrows between objects. Again, we can consider what would happen if, um, you know, we had a functor sending that into the category C, which we're working in. That would allow us to pick out more complicated diagrams. And that's essentially what a limit is. It's, it's like a generalization of the idea of a product. A product is um, this kind of construction where you start with these two objects um, and you're not interested in the arrows between the objects. A limit is that same idea, but um, there may be more than two objects and there may be arrows between them and you want to respect that structure while well, you build this kind of um, thing which has arrows into all the stuff in that structure and can mimic the effects of other candidates which are similar. Um, so anyway, don't worry about that at the moment. At the moment, we just have a category I with two isolated objects and we're just saying we can use a functor D from that category to C to sort of represent the idea of picking out two objects in this category C. Now, next step in working out the categorical product is we want to have this object, this object R, that represents the categorical product. So how do we do that? How do we choose such an object? Well, one way to do it would be to have another category with just one object. And then we can have a functor from here to here that sends this object to R. That would be the same idea we've just talked about. And we're using that to refer to a, a, an, another object. We're not gonna do that today. There is a line of thought uh, that you can take involving that. But what we want to do today is to refer to this object in terms of a functor from this category I. Okay, this category I that represents the pattern that we're kind of looking for. Um, so how can we do it? Well, how about a constant valued functor? How about if we have a functor which just sends both of these objects to R and these identity arrows to the identity arrow of R? So we call such a constant functor delta subscript R. Okay, so here's the sort of textual definition of this constant valued functor here. Um, we pick a, an object in R and we choose that as our subscript and that makes this constant valued functor. It's a functor from I to C. It sends every object little i in this category I, sends it to R. And if we have any arrows in this category I, it's gonna send those arrows to the identity arrow of R. So it just collapses everything down onto this um, object R and its identity arrow. Okay, so here's a picture of what we've got so far, kind of zoomed out. So we, we have a category I and a category C. We have a general functor D from I to C, and we have this constant valued functor from I to C. Now, what's the next thing we need to do? Well, we need to define arrows from R into D of I and D of J. You remember these pi arrows that are sort of the projections that 
the things that go from our categorical product into the objects involved. Okay, so how are we going to define those? Well, we want to have an arrow like this and an arrow like this. And of course, we could just say that, but we want to have a kind of generalizable um, definition. So we want to try and be a bit more clever about how we're going to say that there are arrows from here to here. In particular, we want to express this in the language of category theory, which is involving categories, functors and natural transformations. So can we can we say that these arrows are here using natural transformations? Well, what about a natural transformation from this constant valued functor to this other functor here? What about that? Well, is that going to do the job for us? So consider a natural transformation pi, which goes from delta r to d. What is such a natural transformation? Well, natural transformations have components, okay? You can always think of them in terms of the components. So the i-th component of pi, so it's going to have a component for every object in this category i, and the i-th component is going to be, so it is pi of i, and that's just going to be an arrow in C, which goes from delta r of i to d of i. And what's delta r of i? Well, it's r, okay? This functor just sends all the objects in i to r. So, That's what we want, right? That's what we want. Um, so if we have such a natural transformation pi, then this is going to be the i component of it. And this is going to be the j component of it. So there we have it. Now we know what a candidate is. I mean, okay, I'm actually trying to talk about the actual categorical product, but it itself is a candidate, according to the language I've been using. It's, it's something which um, has an arrow into both of the objects we're interested in. It just happens to be the best candidate. That's what makes it the categorical product. So now we know what a candidate is in this more general sort of language. And actually, I've already used this language before. Um, in the video on natural transformations, um, I spoke about something called cones, and it was precisely this kind of idea. So all a cone is, is it's just going to be an object in this category C, and then a natural transformation from the sort of constant valued functor, which sends everything into that object, to this functor D. Okay, and we can call this functor D the diagram functor because it kind of specifies this diagram, which we're interested in finding a limit of, okay? Um, so let's, I, I'll go through the terminology properly later. Let's just carry on constructing this categorical product. So the next step then, now we know this, is to think about another candidate. OK, so remember, categorical products involve comparison with other candidates. So let's say we have another candidate X here. So let's talk about this other con let's talk about this other candidate X using this language of functors again. So we can sort of refer to it.
using a constant valued functor like that. Now, how do we specify the arrows that this candidate should have into di and dj? Well, just the same idea again, we'll use a natural transformation. So a natural transformation beta from this functor here to our diagram functor D is going to be what we want, okay? So um, this is gonna have two components, the i-th component of beta, and this is going to be the j-th component of beta. Okay, so we have this new terminology now. Rather than talking about candidates, we're talking about cones. What's a cone? Well, a cone of this kind of diagram functor D here, this, this functor which is picking out our diagram for us, is going to be an object X and a natural transformation beta, which sends this X-valued constant functor to D. So we can think of a, a cone as a sort of load of arrows raining down onto our diagram. And X is like, it's, it's sometimes called the apex of the cone, okay? Um, and this is our kind of new idea of a candidate. It, it's, it's basically um, an object and then this natural transformation because we're just using this language of natural transformations to encode this sort of family of arrows, which is coming from our apex into the different things in our diagram. So what's the final thing that we need then to finish this definition of a categorical product? Well, the final thing is just that we need there to be this unique intermediary arrow, H that makes this diagram commute. So we want there to be a unique H such that beta i equals pi i after H for all i. in our index category here, in our category capital I, okay? Um, and that's the definition of a categorical product. So now let's write that down in this new language of functors and cones and natural transformations. And um, then once we think of I as being an arbitrary category instead of this particular one with two isolated objects, we'll just have the definition of a limit. Okay, so now finally we can give the definition of a limit. Okay, um, so in general then, we have an arbitrary category I, now I've been talking about this one here, but let's just say it's an arbitrary one, and we have an arbitrary category C, and we have an arbitrary functor D from I into C. And we'll talk about the limits of that functor. So what is the limit? Well, it's a cone which is better than all the other cones. It's a cone of D which is better than all the other cones of D. In particular, it's gonna be a cone R comma pi, so this is a cone which has this apex, this is just an object, r is just an object of x, and pi is a natural transformation from this r-valued constant functor to d, so that gives us our family of arrows, and it's such that for any cone x, any cone of dx with its natural transformation, beta, into D, so it's got its family of arrows too, there exists this unique intermediary arrow. It's a unique H, which is an arrow of category C, from the apex of the candidate to the apex of the true one. So it go, it's a unique arrow from X to R, such that 
um, it makes the um, it makes the these kind of triangles that we get commute. Okay, in the sense that the if components of um, this natural transformation from this candidate here, this uh, beta i, um, can be written as the if components of our sort of limit cone after this intermediary arrow. So we have beta i equals pi i after h for every object i in the original index category. So yes, extra terminology then. Um, this i here is sometimes called the index category and d is often called a diagram functor. Okay, so this is the definition of a limit and it's an extremely powerful kind of concept. Now, um, it's often written as the limit is often written as lim d. Okay, so I've just been introducing this idea of a limit uh, using this idea of product um, as a sort of motivator. But now we've arrived at the full definition, let's go through an example to see this idea in its full splendor. Okay, so um, what's this limit then? Well, it's a limit of a functor. So we have a functor D and this functor goes from this kind of index category, which holds our pattern to our actual category C here. So it's going to kind of lift this pattern inside this category C, which we're interested in. So this functor D, it'll send an object I to DI, it'll send J to DJ, K will get sent to DK, and these arrows similarly get lifted by this functor. And We're saying that the limit of such a functor D is going to be a cone. So that's going to consist of an apex R. So that's just going to be another object in this category C and a natural transformation. OK, so it's going to be a natural transformation from this constant value functor. So there's going to be this constant value functor here. Delta R, which sends all these objects of our index category into R and all the arrows into the identity arrow of R, which I haven't drawn. Um, and then the cone consists of the apex R together with this natural transformation. So this is going to be a natural transformation from the constant value functor into D, okay? Um, so a way we can draw this, we kind of zoom right out um, to the picture where we have the category of categories. Well, here's category I and here's category C. And here's our functor D. And here's this constant value functor delta R. And we're saying that part of this cone is this natural transformation. Like that. So that's what it looks like in the category of categories. But in this actual kind of down to earth picture here, um, this cone is really going to be a bunch of arrows which go from R 
to the different objects so then the IF comp so in, in the sort of down to earth picture the IF components of this natural transformation is going to be pi i so pi i the IF components will go from delta r of i to d i to d of i what's delta r of i it's just r okay because this is a constant value functor it sends every object of the index category into r so this is going to be the i component of pi the j component is just going to go from this apex to d of j and the cave component is going to go from this index into k now in this example we are actually um, dealing with an index category which has some arrows okay so there's something extra going on and remember that this is a natural transformation so natural transformations it's not enough just to say that they go from where an object got sent to under the first functor to where it got sent to under the second functor. They have to have this extra property as well. They have to commute. They have to form these commuting squares when we consider arrows of our original category. So let's say this is an arrow F here from I to J. Well, that's going to get sent under D to an arrow d of f from d of i to d of j so this second part of the requirement for a natural transformation is that i mean here we have an arrow f and i mean this we want this requirement for every arrow of, of our index category that if we have an arrow f from i to j um, that's going to lead to a commuting square Okay, so this arrow F gets sent under D to this arrow D of F from D of I to D of J. I've drawn it over here as well. And um, it gets sent under delta R to this arrow delta R of F from delta R, delta R of I to delta R of J. And if we want this to be a natural transformation, which we do as part of our definition of a cone, we have to have that this kind of square is going to commute, okay, in the sense that pi j after delta r of f equals d of f after pi of i. We want that to hold for every arrow f of our index category. We didn't talk about this condition before because in the example of a product there were no arrows in the index category but more generally there could be and we want these special kind of arrows coming down from our apex uh, in this definition of a limit to have this property that they're natural transformations that um, when we have arrows of our index category um, they lead to these kind of commuting squares but it's not as complicated as it looks because this is a constant valued functor. So if we think about what happens at the top here and what this stuff actually means, everything simplifies quite a lot. So um, what's delta R of I? Well, that's just gonna be R because this is a constant value functor, sends everything to R. Delta R of J is again, just R. What about delta R of F? How does this constant value functor work on arrows? Well, it sends every arrow to the identity arrow of R. So this is just going to be ID of R. And what happens when we do pi of j after d Well, we just get pi of j. So why are we even bothering to have a square here? Why don't we just have a triangle? Why don't we just 
collapse the top two points of this square. That'll give us an equivalent diagram. If we say that that triangle commutes, it'll mean the same thing. Okay, so what we really require, and I mean, this is um, sort of implied by me saying that this is a natural transformation. I'm just making it more explicit. What we require is that pi j equals d of f after pi of i. And we want this condition to hold for every arrow f in our index category. That's what it means for this to be a natural transformation. That's what it means for this to be a natural transformation. And um, when we're interpreting limits and seeing what limits mean, the fact that it does this is going to be really useful. It's going to mean that limits have lots of interesting meanings in terms of defining different mathematical objects. So anyway, now we um, are sure we know what we mean by these things being natural transformations. Let's carry on. So, um, a limit is a cone, so it's going to be an apex R with this natural transformation that represents these arrows. And it's got to be such that for any other cone, which has an apex X, and is defined by a natural transformation from the x-valued constant functor into d. So that would be corresponding to a load of arrows raining down on our diagram here. b to i, b to j, and b to k. These are the different components of this natural transformation associated with our candidate cone. And again, that has to satisfy that um, commuting condition that I've just rubbed out over here because it's a natural transformation. Uh, so for any other thing like that, there has to exist this unique arrow H which is going to sort of make make these different pieces of the diagram commute okay in the sense that beta i is equal to h after pi i and beta j is equal to h after pi j and beta k is equal to h after pi k and so on so for every object of our index category um, there's going to be an associated component, beta i, of um, this candidate natural transformation that's going to go from x to d of i. And we want to be able to write that um, as a composition of our unique intermediary arrow h after the i-th component of our actual limit cone, where um, this intermediary arrow h is going to go from the apex of, of this candidate cone to the actual apex of our limit cone. So when we have all that stuff, then this stuff here is what we call limb D. Okay, so what's the usefulness of this definition then? Um, well, when the index category just consists of two objects, then we got our definition of a product. A product is a limit um, when the index category is just, um, is just this.
we're going to get and we've seen that a product is a very useful kind of idea we've seen it applied all over the place and it's very easy now we have the idea of a limit to just do variations on that theme so we could say okay what about if we had a category like this well that's going to give us a sort of something called an equalizer which kind of distills the notion of um, sort of solving equations in some sense and we're going to get that out by using a different kind of pattern we can load in lots of different patterns lots of different index categories and get out lots and lots of sort of categorical definitions of really important things that are going on in mathematics okay so now we know what limits are and we know one example of a limit which is the categorical product so it's natural to ask what's the simplest example of a limit and it turns out that the simplest example is actually a terminal object so how can we see that the terminal object is a limit what kind of diagram do we have to pick what kind of functor do we have to choose maybe you'd like to pause the video and think about that for a moment Okay, so it turns out that the terminal object is actually a limit when we pick this index category, I, this pattern, to just be empty. Okay, so when this has no objects in it, this is a kind of um, null sort of functor, a little bit like those functions from the empty set that we were talking about before. And um, there isn't any kind of structure to worry about. So these, um, these kind of cones here don't really have anything to send their arrows down to. So in that case, all we have to do uh, to satisfy this definition of a limit is just have an object that just has one arrow into it from any object. I mean, any object would be a candidate and... Um, so a terminal object, something that just has exactly one arrow into it from any other object, would be a limit of this kind of um, functor from an empty category. OK, so that's how you can think of a terminal object in terms of limits. And so the notion I want to talk about now is something which is called an equalizer. And basically, this allows us to solve equations. OK, so say I ask you to solve the equation x equals x squared in the standard kind of school algebra sort of sense. And you say, OK, well, uh, x is a function which sends numbers to numbers and x squared is a function which sends numbers to numbers and there's going to be a set of numbers that if you put into both of those functions you get the same outputs okay the solutions would be zero and one zero equals zero squared and one equals one squared okay um so how about doing that in general what about if you have two so we're going to start by thinking of this notion in the um, in the category set. OK, so we have two sets, which I'm going to call that I'll call the first set D of I and the second set D of J. And we have two functions, F and G. So we want to solve these. We want to find the solution sets. We want to find the set of members of D of I which gets sent to the same thing as each other under F and under G. And we can formalize this notion exactly in terms of category theory. So not only can we then talk about what it means to solve equations in the category sets, we can actually generalize and take this idea and play with it in other categories as well. And now we know about limits it's extremely easy to set this up all the equalizer is is a limit when we have a index category that looks like this 
an index category with two objects, which I'm calling I and J, and a pair of parallel arrows, which I'm calling A and B here. Um, so we have a sort of index category like this. We lift it into our category of interest using a functor D, a sort of diagram functor. In the category set, what does this limit look like? Well, it's just going to be the set of elements of this set here, the elements N, which have F of N equals G of N. I'm also calling D of A F, and I'm calling D of B G. And I'm saying then the equalizer uh, of this picture here with this arrow and this arrow, also drawn up here, is going to be the set of all N in this set here, which have F of N is equal to G of N. And um, what's going to be the, um, what's going to be the, these um, arrows here. So remember in our limits, we have these sorts of arrows, these components of these natural transformations. So if this, so well, this um, pi i here is just going to inject these elements straight into D of i. It's, it's what we call an inclusion function. Okay, so it just takes this element n of r and just sends it to that same element n, but in D of i. Okay, so it's basically just including its elements in this sort of. Um, in this sort of set that we're doing these functions from. And uh, okay, what's pi of j? Well, pi of j is just gonna send n to f of n, okay? Um, so can we see that this is a natural transformation for a start? Well, it clearly goes from the r valued constant functor to this diagram functor d uh, because it has these arrows um, pi i and pi j going to di and dj respectively so it, it has the right kind of sources and destinations um, with it for its um, arrows coming down into the diagram but um, how do we know that this is a natural transformation. How do we know that pi is a natural transformation from delta of r into d? Well, what we'd want is for each of these kind of triangles to commute here. And that's okay because if we have an element n in r, um, then we're gonna have the when we do pi 1 on the element n, we just get n. And when we do f, we get f of n. So let me draw it, it's easier. So here's n. When we do pi of i on it, we get n. And when we do f on it, we get f of n. And I'm saying we want to define pi of j to just send n to f of n. So that works okay with f. It it forms a commuting triangle with F, so does this, the, this family of arrows, these two arrows. How about with G? Well, yes, it'll work with G as well, because we know that this is the set of all elements in here, such that F of N is equal to G of N. So when we get an element N, pi I takes it to N, g takes it to g of n. Well, we know that g of n is equal to f of n. So that shows that this is going to be a natural transformation, that this triangle commutes and this triangle commutes. Okay, um, well, how about the other property that we need um, for this to be a limit well, we need that for any other candidates, we can replicate its, um, its effects, okay? So here's another candidate. This thing wants to be an equalizer too. And it says, well, I have a function, um, beta i, which sends me into d of i, 
uh, in such a way that um, f after beta i is equal to beta j and g after beta i is equal to b to j, okay? So what does that mean? Well, what that means is that if we have an element x in here, we can put it there. And now we know that b to i of x it's got to be one of these um, elements of D of I, which the same thing happens to it under F and under G. So if we just um, define this intermediary arrow H, so that we send that element X to B to I of X, that will be a member of this sort of solution set. And it's gonna make this diagram commute, okay? So I'll leave it to you to work out the details, but essentially I'm trying to say that this equalizer is just the set of elements um, which it's a set of elements of D of I for which F of that element is equal to G of that element. So just to sort of show you um, the power of this terminology involving natural transformations as well. I've written out in longhand the definition of an equalizer. Now, normally when people talk about equalizers, they don't bother drawing so many arrows in because it's enough just to say, well, I want, so I have um, DI and DJ and I have these arrows F and G going from DI to DJ. And all I want is some object R, which has a arrow, which goes from it into DI. Let's call that arrow pi I, such that for any other object, X, I have this intermediary arrow so that I can emulate the effect of X's arrow into DI that would also make this diagram commute. Okay, so people understand by this diagram that we want these arrows here and here, each of them should be chosen to make this diagram commute. And so there's no point talking about these arrows like pi j and beta j that come into here because they're automatically going to be sort of um, specified. I mean, we know that if beta i makes this commute, then we know that beta j is just going to be f after beta i. Similarly, we know that pi j would just be f after pi i. So people normally draw equalizers more simply like this. Okay, so there's another important idea that we get out of limits, which is something called a pullback. And to get a pullback, all we have to do is set our index category to look like this, okay? So it just has to be three objects with the arrows kind of pointing into, the, into one of the objects, like a kind of V. And in this case, if we embed this in our category of interest, we get a diagram like this. And then a pullback of this kind of diagram is just going to be a limit of this functor here. So what do pullbacks represent in the category of sets? Well, basically, um, imagine, so I'm calling this, what, what this arrow got lifted to, I'm calling it F. And I'm calling what this arrow got lifted to, I'm calling it G. And then the pullback of this diagram 
is just going to be the set of elements, so the set of, it's just going to be the set of pairs, n, m, with n from d, i, and m from d, j, such that n and m in a pair get sent to the same thing in d, k, under these respective functions, f and g. So for an example, let's say we want to work out the set of words that have an even length, okay? So let's have di to be the set of words, and we'll have dj to be the set of non-negative whole numbers. So that could be a natural number object, okay? Um, and then we'll have f, when f operates on a, on a word, let's say it gives the length of the word, and when g operates on a number, let's say it gives two times that number, okay? So k is also, say, a natural number object. Well, then what r would be, it would be the set of n comma m, which is such that f of n equals g of m. So that would be the set of words n and numbers m, such that the length of n is equal to two times m. So it would give us all of the words that have even length paired with a number that if we times it by two gives the length of our word. So these pullbacks in set theory, they represent sort of how we can figure out the collection of stuff in two sets that get mapped to the same thing in a third set. Um, I'll let you work out the details and sort of show that that is what a pullback corresponds to. But I mean, really the, the essence of the definition is that it's a limit of a functor which embeds this kind of index category into our category of interest. So it turns out, in fact, that an initial object of a category also corresponds to a limit. Um, so in that case, what kind of functor would an initial object be a limit of? Well, it turns out that if we let this index category be equal to our category C that we're looking for limits of, that we're looking for limits in. Um, and then we let this diagram functor D be the identity functor. Then it turns out that the limit of such an identity functor, which just sends every object in I to itself and every arrow in I to itself, well, you know, in C, but C is the same as I, so it's effectively just not changing anything. Uh, it turns out if we have such an identity functor and we find the limit of that, that's going to be an initial object of this category C. Okay? So what I'm saying is... When I equals C and D is equal to the identity functor of C. Then the limit of D corresponds to an initial object. C. So I'll leave that to you as an exercise. It's a nice exercise to understand what limits are. To try to convince yourself of that. See if you can come up with a proof of it. Okay, so now we've got our head around what limits are. It's time for something easy, which is the dual idea of a limit. It's called a co-limit. So we pretty much already understand what this is because we just dualize the ideas which we've already which we've already discussed. So if we just sort of reverse the directions of the arrows in our construction, we get this notion of co-limit. And 
there are lots of important co-limits and they're very important. So we've already seen this kind of idea because we've obviously seen a lot of this kind of limit called a product. And we saw earlier on that was in a previous video, we saw that dualized to give us this notion of a co-product. Um, and the other kinds of famous limits also have their duals. So the dual of an equalizer is called a co-equalizer. The dual of a pullback is called a push out. Um, I'm not going to go through the um, ideas of those, but let me just tell you the general notion of what a co-limit is. So I'm just going to spell it out explicitly. Um, but I mean, you can basically see here, it's, it's very similar to the diagram we have with the limits, but now all these arrows are coming from the diagram up. And we're still having this idea of building the arrows of the candidates uh, using the arrow of the um, our actual thing, in this case, our co-cone um, and an intermediary arrow. It's just things are working in the opposite direction now. So, OK, so a co-cone of D is going to be a object X. That will be the apex of the co-cone. And now the arrows are going to be coming up from the diagram into the apex. So the arrows are going to begin by a natural transformation beta from the diagram to this constant value functor. So we could, well, it'd be a, you know, it's a natural transformation from here to here. What does this look like in the category C? Well, the i component of this cocone is going to go from D of i into x. So every object's going to have a kind of arrow going up to this apex. So that's the idea of a cocone. What's a co-limit? Well, it's the best cocone in some sense, okay? So it's going to be a cocone with an apex r, and this natural transformation from D to the r-valued constant functor. So that's just going to have all these arrows kind of flying up to the apex here um, of this cocone. And it's going to be such that for any other cocone, like this one here, there's going to be a unique intermediary arrow, this time going from our co-limit to our candidate. And it's going to be such that the i-th component of the natural transformation for the candidate, beta i, um, is going to be h after pi of i. So doing using the components of our cocone um, and then our unique intermediary arrow gives us the component of our candidate. And that's going to be the case for every member of the index category, every object i in the index category, big I. OK, so like I say, um, this is a sort of equally important notion, but because it's all dual, we don't really have to do any extra work to understand what it is. Um, and we basically have that the, the, the dual notion of a product is a co-limit called a co-product, the dual notion of an equalizer is a co-limit called a co-equalizer. The dual notion of a pullback is a co-limit called a push-out. And so whenever we do stuff with limits, we can basically dualize it and get free results about co-limits because it's just the same kind of idea, just with arrows reversed. Okay, so what we're going to do now is to understand limits as universal morphisms, okay? Um, when I told you about universal morphisms in the, previous, in the previous video, I said that they were one of the most important concepts in category theory. Now, limits are very important too, but limits are actually just a special case of universal morphisms. And in understanding this, we're going to see how things mesh together very, very nicely. And also, um, we're going to really appreciate more about 
where this definition of a limit comes from um, and think and we're going to be able to look at it look at what's going on from kind of three different perspectives okay so the most kind of zoomed out view to look at this is to think about it in the context of the category of categories okay so we have this category i which we're representing as an object in this category c which we're representing as an object this is the diagram function or d in this picture it's just an arrow from i to c and then this would be this r valued constant functor delta r and this would be this x valued functor delta x and then these cones are really sort of defined by these natural transformations so a natural transformation pi from delta r to d um, is defining sort of the arrows um, raining down from this apex r onto our um, sort of diagram picture uh, with di with objects di dj and dk in our category c um, and um, in this sort of argument, we're going to be relating that natural transformation to a natural transformation involved with another cone, which has an apex X. I've drawn a smaller version of this diagram up at the top right. This is sort of looking at what a limit is from the point of view of a, um, a the category of categories. And then zooming in a bit, we can think of this functor category so this is a category which has these functors now as our objects and the natural transformations between them become arrows and then the most kind of zoomed in view is just what's actually going on in the categories and this is the familiar picture of what a limit is uh, where we actually look inside the categories i and c and we can see the components of the natural transformations and so on so i is our index category this is sort of our pattern that we're interested in and d is our functor which is kind of lifting this pattern into our category c and then um, our limit r is going to be a an a an, ob, an apex r and a natural transformation pi which goes from this kind of r valued constant functor this functor that sends everything to r to this um this diagram functor here so that defines kind of the arrows of our limit cone um but our cone has to be such this limit cone has to be such that for any other cone like this one here which has an apex x and is defined by a sort of natural transformation beta from this x valued constant functor delta x to d um, there has to be this unique intermediary arrow h which sort of makes these um, arrows of these which commutes with these arrows of the cone so that like beta i would equal pi i after h and beta j would equal pi j after h and so on okay so that's what a limit is what we're going to do is look at this but I, I would say this is the most challenging part of this um this argument is understanding this first line okay because we've been talking about these constant valued functors okay so this is the constant valued functor that sends all of these objects to R and all the arrows to the identity arrow of R. And this is the constant value functor that sends all of these objects to X and all of the arrows to the identity arrow of X. Um, and so we can pick a particular value um, for this subscript here. I mean, if we pick R, then what we get out is the r valued constant functor if we pick x what we get out is the x valued constant functor so 
what we really have is a sort of thing where we put in the value of the constant that we want and we get out this constant valued functor. So we're actually going to think of that thing as a functor itself, okay? So I'm saying we specify, we have a functor and what we put in is, a, is an object of C. So we put in a, a sort of subscript value and what we get out is a constant valued functor which sends everything to x okay so if we put this as x we get out this so what this actually is is it's sending objects in this category c to functors functors which go from i to c okay so if we pick if we operate this functor here on an object x from c, we get this functor, this constant functor delta subscript x. If we pick a value r from c, we get this functor delta subscript r. Okay, um, so that's why I have this notation here. Remember this here, c to the power of i, that represents this category of functors from i to c, okay? Uh, and this is, I've drawn part of it here, okay? So the objects of this category are functors, which go from i to c. Here's d, that's a member of this category, because it goes from i to c. Here's delta x and here's delta r. And I'm saying now, let's think of this as a functor. This is the so-called diagonal functor. Um, and it will send an object R to delta subscript R. It will send an object X to delta subscript X. So it sends objects of C to functors from I to C. In other words, it sends objects of C to members of the functor category. Now, how does... So a functor has to operate on objects and arrows okay so I've told you how it operates on objects how does it operate on arrows well what about if we have an arrow h from x to r something like this okay well um, that's got to be lifted to an arrow which goes from delta an arrow which I'll call delta h which goes from delta subscript x to delta subscript r so what is that? Well, that's an arrow between functors in this functor category. So it's a natural transformation, okay? Um, and it should be such that... Um, it is a natural transformation. It should be such that delta H of I ought to go from delta x operating on i to delta r operating on i. That's how natural transformations are supposed to work. But we know that this is just going to be x, because this is a constant functor which sends every i to x, and this is a constant functor that sends every i to r. So we know that every component of this natural transformation ought to send x to r. And in fact, we know that h does that, h sends x to r. So it makes sense to define uh, how this uh, diagonal functor works on arrows to say that it gives a natural transformation which has each component equal to the arrow which it's operating on. So what I'm saying is that for an arrow h from x to r, when we lift this arrow under our diagonal functor, we get this natural transformation that just has each of its components equal to h. Okay then, so that's all we really need to know. Um, the rest pretty much just falls straight out. So all I have to do now is to define a certain kind of terminal morphism and then 
it's almost immediate that we'll see that that is exactly what the definition of a limit is. Okay, so remember a terminal morphism, we say it goes from a functor to an object. So what's the functor and what's the object? Well, the functor is going to be this diagonal functor. And what's the object? Now, this is the other bit, which is a bit strange. Uh, I'm saying the object is D. And you're probably saying, well, hang on. D isn't an object. D is a functor. Um, well, yeah, D is a functor, but we're thinking of d as an object we're thinking of it as an object in the functor category okay so there it is um so we're imagining this diagonal functor here as a functor which sends what's going on in category c to what's going on in this functor category i mean we know it sends x to delta subscript x it sends r to delta subscript r and in our definition of a terminal morphism, we're picking an object of this target category. And we're picking this object D, which is this diagram functor here that we're interested in finding a limit of. So yes, it is a functor, but we're thinking of it in this context as an object in the functor category. So, OK, let's carry on. A terminal morphism from this diagonal functor to this diagram functor D. Well, what is it? It's going to be an object in our source category, an object R, and then an arrow from where the object got sent into our object of interest. So it's going to be an arrow pi, which goes from delta subscript R to D. So this is an arrow in the functor category. In other words, it's a natural transformation from delta R to D. OK, um, but let's think of it in the functor category for now. So it's an arrow from delta subscript R to D. And since this is a terminal morphism, the idea is that for any other um, for any other sort of candidates that the, the arrow of that candidate can be kind of emulated by a unique by using a unique intermediary arrow. OK, so it so our terminal morphism is a object R of C and this arrow pi from delta subscript R to D such that for any similar thing. So for any X, which is an object in C. And any beta, which goes from delta subscript x to d, so something like this, there's going to exist a unique kind of intermediary arrow, h, which goes from x to r, so something like this, that if we lift it under our functor, so if we do the diagonal functor of it, we get something that makes this diagram commute, okay? So pi after delta subscript h equals beta. OK, so what are we doing with this diagram? We're composing functors. OK, we're saying that pi after delta h equals beta. This is the sort of punchline of our um, terminal morphism definition. OK, um, so how are we composing these natural transformations? Is it horizontal composition or vertical composition? Well, it's vertical composition, OK, because these are natural transformations between these parallel functors. So we want to do vertical composition. That's the easy one. OK, so we want um, beta to equal pi after delta H. So what does that mean? Well, we can just think of it in terms of components, OK? So um, the i-th component, what we're just saying is that for every i, um, we can compose the i-th component so that beta i is equal to pi of i after delta h of i. 
and this is easy because we know um, what delta H of I is. We have it up here. It's just H, okay? So we just have that beta I is equal to pi I after H for every I in the index category. So does this look like the definition of a limit to you? I mean, this is really the place to see what's really going on here. Um, what we're saying is that a terminal morphism is going to be an object R in the category C and a natural transformation pi from delta R to D. So that's going to have each of these components as a particular arrow. And it's going to be such that for every other thing like that, so for every other object in X with its natural transformation from delta X to D, so that's going to be another cone up here, um, there's going to exist a unique intermediary arrow. So this is going sort of between the apexes of the cones, from the apex of X to the apex of R, which makes these kind of arrows commute okay so that beta i is equal to pi i after h beta j is equal to pi j after h beta k is equal to pi k after h and so on and that's exactly the definition of a limit okay so now we see that a limit of d is simply a terminal morphism from this diagonal functor to d okay that's Nice, very nice, concise definition of um, what a limit is. And what do we get out of this? Well, we know that um, any two terminal morphisms from a given thing to a given thing are going to be isomorphic to each other. I demonstrated that in my video on universal properties. So now we know that any two limits of the same diagram functor d are going to be isomorphic to each other okay so we have um we don't have to worry anymore if we find um multiple kind of solutions to this limit finding problem in a particular case because any of those solutions are going to be isomorphic and it also means that when we're trying to convince ourselves that a certain sort of limit definition gives us a kind of thing that we want, a kind of mathematical structure that interests us. All we have to do is show that that mathematical structure corresponds to an example of our limit according to our definition. And then we know that anything else which fits our limit definition will be isomorphic to that mathematical object. So we kind of get the... Um, converse when we're proving stuff is equivalent to a limit we get the kind of converse result for free because of this isomorphism property